I'm Laura Schoenfeld, your host as always, and we have a really interesting conversation for you all today all about skin health. Now, we don't do a ton of content on skin health. I actually have a friend whose name is Jen Fugo who has an entire podcast all about skin health, so I would definitely recommend checking her stuff out if you're someone who wants to learn a lot more about skin and the different things that can affect your skin. But we do have a couple of guests upcoming that are going to be talking about skin health, which is really exciting. And our first is today's guest, Dr. Julie Greenberg, who is a licensed naturopathic doctor and she specializes in integrative dermatology. Dr. Greenberg is the founder for the Center for Integrative Dermatology, a holistic clinic that approaches skin problems by finding and treating the root cause. Dr. Greenberg holds degrees from Northwestern University, Stanford University, and Bastyr University. She lectures at naturopathic medical schools and speaks at conferences across the U.S. on the topics of hair, skin, and nails. Dr. Greenberg is the program chair for the Naturopathic and Integrative Dermatology Series on LearnSkin.com, which is a 20-course CE program for doctors, dietitians, and other healthcare providers that discusses evidence-based alternative approaches to treating dermatological conditions. So Dr. Greenberg has a ton of wisdom to share about skin health and what the true root causes of skin health is, which surprise, surprise, a lot of it has to do with the gut, kind of like what we were talking about last week with Dina Norton. But this is something that, again, so many people experience gut issues and they're given inaccurate or unhelpful advice from their conventional medical providers. And it's really important to understand where these skin issues come from and how we can deal with them. So we have a great episode for you today. And without further ado, here is Dr. Julie Greenberg. Hi, I'm Laura Schoenfeld. I'm a registered dietitian and coach trained in functional medicine with a passion for helping women just like you ditch perfectionism and use food, fitness, and self care to fuel your bigger God given purpose. I believe that it's possible to achieve your biggest life-changing goals without the frustration, obsession, or negative self-talk that so many women subject themselves to every day. All you need are the right tools, the right mindset, and the faith to turn your dreams into reality. I'm here to guide you along the way. The truth is that you are so much more than a body, and I'm on a mission to help you change the way you think and act at a core beliefs level, so you can transform your physical, mental, and spiritual health from the inside out. Are you ready to become fed and fearless in your pursuit of a healthy, meaningful life? Welcome to the Fed and Fearless Podcast. All right, everybody. Well, I am so excited to have with me on the show today, Dr. Julie Greenberg. Welcome to the Fed and Frills podcast, Julie. Thanks, Laura. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah. And so for those of our listeners who are not familiar with you and your work, can you just tell us your story in a nutshell about how you became an expert in integrative dermatology? Yes. I guess I should start by explaining to your listeners what a ND or naturopathic doctor is because I'm sure some of them have never heard of one before. So an ND is, as I said, a naturopathic doctor. That's in contrast to an MD or medical doctor. There are kind of similarities and differences. Similarities, we both have four years of medical school. We're licensed and uh, we have to take board exams. And so I'm a licensed doctor in California, Oregon, and Washington. The first two years of medical school is the same for an ND or an MD. We're studying how is the body supposed to work, what happens when things go wrong and we get disease. But the last two years is where we really differ. So medical doctors are trained primarily in the use of pharmaceuticals. That's why when most people go to their doctor, they're expecting to be handed a prescription and to go to their pharmacy and pick up like a tube of something or a pill. It can work great, but when it comes to skin, it often is really not addressing what we call the root cause. It's addressing symptoms. So if you take something like eczema, you have this rash, there's all this inflammation. Your dermatologist is pretty much always going to start you on a tube of topical steroids, and that's just to push that inflammation back down. But as I say to patients, well, is your problem that you are deficient in topical steroids? 
The obvious answer is no. So a lot of uh, Western medicine is really addressing symptoms and not root causes. The goal of a naturopathic doctor is to address root causes. That's always where we're starting. And so we are trained on pharmaceuticals, and I do sometimes prescribe them, but it's definitely not my first line. We are uh, trained in nutrition. So we are the only licensed doctors in the U.S. who have significant training on nutrition, and we are tested on our boards in order to become licensed naturopathic doctors. We have to pass nutrition, which I know is near and dear to your heart. But yeah, it's amazing. Medical doctors can make it through four years of medical school with even no nutrition classes, not even one, which is really a shame and needs to change. Uh, We're trained in herbal medicine. So four years of um, studying the herbs, how to use them, how to use them safely, formulating and using them. I'm also a registered herbalist through the American Herbalist Guild. And so we study all these other modalities to try to get to the root cause. And and one of our fundamental tenets is treat the whole person. So also in Western uh, medicine, we like to chop up the body and pretend like they're totally separate things. So, hey, you got a skin problem, go see a dermatologist. You got a gut problem, go see a gastroenterologist. And oh, are you kind of depressed or anxious? Okay, well, you need a psychiatrist. And all three of those doctors are going to be doing different things for you. They're not talking to each other. They're not thinking about the systems. But in naturopathic medicine, we say you have to treat the whole person. We are one person, one body, one mind and spirit, and everything impacts everything else. And so all this, I know kind of long-winded explanation of a naturopathic doctor helps set up how I got involved in skin and dermatology because my training is as a naturopathic doctor and I've been passionate about skin. And so my approach to treating skin is quite different than a conventional dermatologist. And I say, I'm not a dermatologist. I'm a naturopathic doctor who specializes in skin. And that means that I focus on the skin, obviously, but I'm really focused on the gut and the other systems as well. And I treat them kind of how I came to dermatology was kind of naturopathic, but it was before I was actually a doctor. I was diagnosed with something called Hashimoto's um, hypothyroidism, which is a very common autoimmune disease. It happens a lot in women, starts in their late 20s, which happened to me. And basically my body stopped recognizing my thyroid as self and started attacking it. And it took a few years to get diagnosed. And once I was diagnosed is that I live in Los Angeles. It was at USC Medical Center, which is a major medical center, the head of endocrinology. And he just came in and was like, yeah, you, so you've got this autoimmune disease and you know, pretty much there's not much we can do about it. We don't know what causes it. And you're going to kind of continue to attack your thyroid. So we're going to give you these medications, but probably you're going to continue to gain weight and be tired. And I just walked out of that appointment shell-shocked. You know, I was 29 and I was like, what just happened? Like, what, how does, how can this be? And it sent me off on this whirlwind of research. Like this just doesn't feel like that could be the final answer. Like, why am I doomed to being tired and overweight the rest of my life? And as I started researching the endocrine, I was kind of driven down the path of dermatology because so many of the skincare products that we put on our skin are endocrine disruptors and affect the thyroid gland. And um, I had never thought about it before. I had never thought about what I was putting on my skin. And as it turns out, women put an average of 125 chemicals on their skin every day. That's a huge toxic body burden that the body then has to deal with. So I started researching skincare and making my own skincare for me and my family. Of course, I started researching nutrition. And when I was growing up, you know, a healthy lunch was a lean cuisine and a Diet Coke. We didn't know any better. This was the 80s, the 90s. So it led me down the path of nutrition and like, oh my goodness, what have I been eating? This isn't even real food. So I really became passionate about dermatology and I started formulating things for friends and family. And and eventually I got I actually have an MBA from Stanford and I was in the business world, but I became so motivated and passionate about dermatology and health that it drove me to go back and become a naturopathic doctor and and specialize in dermatological conditions. Wow, that's so interesting. I feel like normally when people get passionate about a topic, it's because they had the condition themselves, but it sounds like yours was kind of a backdoor entry into the world of skin health because of how unfortunately, not great the skincare world is and how many chemicals that are in most products. And um, that's really interesting. That's not actually what I would have expected. So that's really cool. 
That's why I say it's it's a naturopathic kind of entree into dermatology because I got there through the thyroid, but it's all connected. Mm -hmm. Everything in our body is connected. Definitely. So now that you're in the world of integrative dermatology, I'm sure that you see hundreds of people every year just dealing with different skin issues. And what are some of the biggest myths that your patients come to you believing when it comes to healing their skin conditions? That's a great question. And I think the number one thing is my patients come to me a lot of times really focused 100% on their diet and convinced that like there's one food that's causing the eczema or there's one food that's calling causing the rosacea or the psoriasis and if only they could find that food then you know everything would suddenly miraculously heal and they've been on these elimination diets and they've done all of this type of food testing so there's there's different types of food testing there's food allergy testing and as I know you know, but just to let your listeners know, food allergies are what we call true allergies. They're an IgE reaction. That's like when you hear somebody eats a peanut and they can't breathe or they eat seafood and their mouth blows up. That's a true food allergy. But there's something else called food sensitivities, which are delayed sensitivity reactions to foods. And that's like maybe you eat dairy and you know you get a stomach ache or you eat a, like gluten and then a few days later, whatever your symptoms are, get worse. So I have people convinced that if they could just find that one or a couple of foods, it's going to magically go away. And it's really not true. So what I tell people and what I lecture on all the time is food absolutely matters 100%. And food can absolutely be a trigger and make your symptoms worse, but it is generally not the root cause. So we still have to go deeper. Every patient, we talk about diet, we focus on diet, and every single patient after the first visit has homework, which is go home, track what you're eating for three or four days, and what I want them to send me is their fiber total. Because fiber, I tell them, that is your ticket, your passport to health, is your ticket to not having to see doctors, not having skin problems, and not being on a thousand supplements. But that goes hand in hand with the gut work I do. And that is testing and treating the gut because we have to clean up what's currently going wrong. And then fiber is what helps keep you smooth sailing and not get back to where you were. So I think it's the diet stuff. People, I don't know why and how it kind of got going, but they're just so convinced that like, it's all about the food. And if they can just find that one food, it's going to magically disappear. And I have people who are in such restrictive diets and they've been that way for so long and you can get malnutrition and you can drive yourself absolutely crazy. And people can develop what we call orthorexia, which is kind of a a fear of like eating foods and then it becomes so constrained and people are down to like five foods and that's not good. That's not good, good for us or our microbiome. Our microbiome needs diverse inputs of lots of different kinds of vegetables and foods and not the same thing every day. That's not what would happen in nature is that we'd get, you know, five foods for a year. So that's not how we're set up to be healthy. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a huge theme of this podcast. Being called the Fed and Fearless podcast is really helping people not develop that orthorexic type of behavior because as you've just explained, and it comes up a lot with all the different topics we cover is this issue of going on overly restrictive diets that are pulling out all this stuff hoping that that's what's going to resolve the particular health issue that they're dealing with. And and not to say that there might not be a few things that, you know, would be beneficial to remove or avoid for a bit, but they end up getting into this situation where they are malnourished. And especially with the skin, I mean, just there's so many nutrients and, you know, with your thyroid, if you're not getting enough calories, your thyroid's not going to be functioning great. So that can affect your skin, like you were saying before. So you don't want to get into the situation where you're on such a restrictive diet that not only are your gut bugs not happy, but also you're literally getting malnourished from not having the diversity of food. Absolutely. You're, you're absolutely right. And I, and I do have people who unfortunately kind of gone down that path. So yeah, we definitely want to prevent that. And I like to focus on what they can eat. And so we focus on, there's just such a beautiful wide array of vegetables that I think we kind of ignore in Western society. And so I tell patients that our goal is 30 different vegetables a week and 35 grams of fiber. And the goal is to eat the rainbow. And so one thing I have them do is when they go to the market, go to the produce aisle, shop your normal stuff, pull your vegetables and stuff into the cart, and then do a rainbow check, literally red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet. What colors are missing from my cart? 
Okay, now you're going to go back out to the produce aisle and pull something from that color group. So purple is, is often missing. And it kind of tends to expand people because now they're like, oh my gosh, I never realized how many purple vegetables there are. There's purple cauliflower, purple onions, purple cabbage, purple sweet potatoes. You know, there's, there's a whole world out there that we aren't really exploring. And so while I do often take patients off of dairy and gluten because they are inflammatory foods and, and tend not to play well with gut and skin conditions, I don't want people to feel restricted. I want them to feel expansive. And so we really talk about bringing new things into the diet for exactly the reasons you're talking about. I love that rainbow method. I feel like I, for whatever reason, I've never heard anyone explain it that way that like you do the rainbow check. I love that. I'm going to have to try that next time I'm at the grocery store because I've never thought about it that way. But you're right. I mean, there are so many colorful plant foods that you get into like a rut, especially I send my husband out grocery shopping a lot. So he's a, uh, he's a Midwestern farm boy. So looking for purple produce and stuff probably isn't something he's used to doing. So next time we go shopping, I'll have to see if we can do the, the rainbow <laughs> check. Excellent. So all of that said, I would love to hear, you were saying before, skin issues are not a deficiency of medication, right? I mean, I think everyone could probably easily agree with that. But I know that when we have skin issues, a lot of times it's reflecting another issue going on. It's not that your skin is, you know, itself the problem or that you need some kind of topical treatment because your skin is, you know, missing some moisturizer or something like that. So what is the body trying to tell us when we have a skin issue come up like acne, eczema, rosacea, any of those more common skin issues that people have? And that's a great question. And, and, and that also leads to the second thing that people I think most commonly misbelieve about skin is, well, it's happening here. So I'm going to put something on it and that's going to fix it. But you're absolutely right. The body is telling us something because skin issues are obviously we can see it. There are things that we can do topically and all of my protocols involve beautiful herbal natural botanicals to support the skin, but you can't fix these chronic dermatological issues like this just by the outside in. The body is telling you there's a problem inside. There's inflammation happening. And most of these chronic derm diseases are what we call systemic inflammatory diseases. So psoriasis, rosacea, eczema, acne, alopecia areata is an autoimmune disease where now, like I was talking about autoimmune, we're attacking the thyroid. This is where people attack the hair follicle and they lose their hair. Vitiligo is where we attack the melanocytes or the colored pigment in the skin and we get these white patches on skin. So the body is trying to tell you there's a huge problem, there's inflammation, and 100% of the time I have found that it starts in the gut. It may go beyond that. Someone may be exposed to toxins like heavy metals or mycotoxins, which are things produced by molds. So there can be other elements to it. And that's more particularly true with the autoimmune diseases like alopecia areata, vitiligo, psoriasis. But it always starts in the gut. There's always what we call dysbiosis in the gut. And that means there's too little of the good guys and too many of the bad guys. And that really kicks off a whole series of problems in the gut. And leaky gut is one of the main issues. For your listeners who have heard the term leaky gut, but maybe don't know exactly what it is, I do actually a, a visual for my patients where I show them a leaky and a healthy gut. But obviously in our gut, in our small and large intestine, we have cells in there, intestinal epithelial cells, and they're supposed to be stuck together like this with tight junctions. So there's not supposed to be stuff getting through. And right underneath these cells is our bloodstream. And that makes sense because the whole reason why we're eating is we need to break down that food into teeny little parts, get it into the bloodstream, and send it out to every cell in the body. That's life. Without that process, you know, we're going to die within two weeks. So makes sense that the bloodstream is there. And then we have a really robust immune system in that bloodstream, just trying to monitor, is anything getting through that we need to be alarmed about and get on? Because once it's in the bloodstream, we got to take action. So a healthy gut has an, a layer of what we call mucosa. It's just mucus. So I think we know if you feel in your mouth, yeah, oh yeah, there's mucus in there. And we kind of know that there's mucus in our respiratory tract because when we get sick, we start producing a lot of mucus in our sign, in our nose and in our lungs to try to get that thing out. 
but we have a whole layer of thick mucus in our whole digestive tract, which is excellent and protective because those little cells that I talked about are really delicate. And so they can't be touching the food and bacteria that lives in our gut. And so there's this whole thick layer of mucus protecting them. Well, sometimes that mucus layer gets eroded and now these cells are touching the bacteria and food and they're not built for that. And they start to die and they open up and that's the leaky gut is that there's no longer this tight junctions that this connection between them and now food and bacteria and junk from our upper system can get through into the bloodstream. And once it hits the bloodstream, there has to be inflammation. It's like when the Capitol was breached, you have to respond in force and get that thing, try to get it out. And that's what happens in the bloodstream. And when we have a chronic leaky gut and we chronically have bacteria, yeast like candida and food leaking into the gut, we're going to have chronic inflammation. And that's where a lot of these food sensitivities that I talked about stem from. It's not fully digested pieces of food getting into the bloodstream. And the body doesn't know like what beef is. It's not the bloodstream in our system is not supposed to see beef in the bloodstream. It's supposed to see what are called amino acids. And those are the building blocks of proteins. So when the body gets a, an amino acid like leucine, it's like, oh yeah, I know what to do with this. No worries. When the body sees a little piece of beef, it's like, well, I don't even know what that is. That is alarming. And so it's going to start to attack and produce these food sensitivities. And I find when I heal my patient's guts, a lot of these food sensitivity issues just go away. We actually had almost the identical conversation talking with our last guest about how this affects digestive symptoms in things like IBS. And it's just so interesting how so many people assume that the food sensitivity is the cause of the problem rather than a symptom of the problem. You were mentioning the mucosa lining being something that can get degraded. Are there any specific things that tend to degrade the mucosal lining for people? Yes, many. And unfortunately, our Western society is now kind of set up to put us in this situation with leaky gut. And I will say leaky gut, as you've discussed, is not just related to derm and gut, but lots of chronic diseases. It's now related to you know diabetes, heart disease, hypertension. So all sorts of the chronic issues that Americans deal with. Some of the main things that will set people up for leaky gut is use of antibiotics. And the reason is kind of multifactorial. Sometimes, you know, we need to take antibiotics. They're life-saving. So I definitely am not saying never take antibiotics, but we know we've had an overuse of antibiotics. A lot of people went in with colds and the doctor wanted to do something. So they gave them an antibiotic. Well, most colds are viral. That's not going to do anything. And every time we take an antibiotic, let's say even you had a kidney infection. Yeah. Take that antibiotic. You must, right? We, that's a life-threatening situation. So you have a kidney infection, you take the antibiotic, it's going to kill off the bad bacteria that are causing your kidney inf infection, which we want, but if there's collateral damage. It's going to kill off good gut bacteria too. That's just the nature of antibiotics. So now we got to have a little bit of a problem because there are good gut bacteria that help us maintain that mucosal lining and a lot of antibiotics will kill them off. So that puts us at risk for leaky gut. Every time we take antibiotics and it kills off bacteria, yeasts and molds like candida is a yeast that lives in our gut. I think women know, oh, if I take antibiotics, I might get a vaginal yeast infection. The reason is the antibiotic kills off the bacteria, including good gut bacteria like lactobacillus. And now the candida is like, whoa, there's a lot of room in here. Now is my chance. And it's just like if you're at a crowded pool and someone gets up and leaves their lounge chair, you're going to pounce on it. You're going to put your you know, towel, your book, your sunglasses. And if that person comes back an hour later, you're going to be like, well, I'm sorry you left. It's, it's my lounge chair now. Candida does the same thing. It's like, woo, here's our chance. And it just starts to bloom and take over. And then you have to get it back down again. And those ba good bacteria who are trying to come back there's no more lounge chairs left for them and they can't thrive. And candida will degrade the mucosal layer and bad bacteria who maybe were resistant to that particular kind of antibiotic will overgrow in the same way and they can produce toxins that will degrade the mucosal layer. So our overuse of antibiotics has definitely contributed. Alcohol, and just to pause for a second, I feel like with the antibiotics piece, that's probably something, you know, in the dermatological space that people are constantly prescribed either oral or topical antibiotics for like acne and other types of skin issues. So it seems like it would be something that 
not only wouldn't actually solve the problem that the person is going to the dermatologist for, but could be making things a lot worse, especially over time. You're 100% right. So acne and rosacea, two of the mainstay treatments are what we call low-dose antibiotics. And so people are just literally taking an antibiotic chronically. They're always on it. And sometimes their acne or their rosacea will get better while they're chronically on the antibiotic. But the minute they go off it, it's going to come back. And then you know, a lot of times they'll come see, see me having been through this. I have to go clean up all that gut dysfunction. So you're absolutely right. It's it's not a fix and it ends up putting them off in a, in a worse situation than if they didn't do that in the first place. And it didn't fix the acne or rosacea because it just races right back as soon as they're done. And, and for a lot of people, it doesn't work. And now they've taken all these antibiotics topically and orally. And again, you're not deficient in antibiotics. So that's not the problem. 100%. It's, it's a big problem in Durham. I had a bad experience because I was having a breakout before my wedding. And I was like, this is not okay. You know, I was a little bit desperate and I was prescribed an antibiotic and I took it. And then I got severe sun sensitivity to the point where I literally developed melasma from it. Just like one, one 15 minute walk with my dog outside. And I literally got this like melasma mask that I've been now dealing with for like four years now. So it's just one of these like, it's unintended consequences and things that, again, we're not saying antibiotics should never be used, but it's something that for sure can cause a lot worse problems than what you were trying to solve. And I can speak from personal experience that I wish I hadn't taken it because I was, again, a little bit like desperate to fix it in the couple of months before my wedding. And it was like, great, now I have this other problem that literally there is no solid treatment for the way that the acne probably could have been dealt with. So Little side note there, uh, didn't mean to derail you, but I just knew that the antibiotics thing was probably important to kind of touch on a little bit deeper. Yeah, no, you're right. That was probably doxycycline. And one of the main side effects of doxycycline is sun sensitivity. And all antibiotics, all medications have potential side effects beyond even what they're doing to the gut. As you said, sun sensitivity, now you have melasma. And that's that's the problem with the Western approach is so I'm going to age myself, but we had a game called Whack-A-Mole back when we had video arcades and we used to go in person and there was these little, you know, plastic moles that, and you had to whack them down as soon as they popped up. And we get that in Western medicine where we start playing Whack-A-Mole with polypharmacy. So, okay, you've got this first problem. We're going to whack it down with an antibiotic. Uh Oh, but now the antibiotic gave you the second thing. So now we have to whack it down with the second medication. Whoops. That one gave you a third problem. We got to whack it down and people end up on all of these medications because of these symptoms that the medications are causing. And it's, it's a tough way to live. Yeah. Well, so you were talking about alcohol before I interrupted you. So I don't know if you want to continue on that. Yeah, I was just going to go through some of the other things that can lead to this degradation of the mucosal layer, basically leading to leaky gut. So alcohol, not like, you know, you have a drink, you know, once or twice a week, but a more chronic consumption of alcohol will erode that mucosal layer. Um, It also starts to feed things like candida because we convert alcohol into sugar so you can get candida overgrowth. Chronic use of certain medications. So people who are on a lot of ibuprofen or Advil, not like, again, maybe... For once a month for your period, you have really bad cramps and you take an Advil, fine. But it's more, there are people who are on Advil every day for joint or other types of pain. And that is going to degrade your mucosal linings to certain medications. And just a generalized lack of fiber in the diet, which we have a huge problem with in America. The average American gets 15 grams of fiber. I like my patients to get at least 35 grams of fiber a day because, again, we have good gut bacteria that maintain the mucosal lining that help us. And those good bacteria make products that we can't make on our own. And if we're not feeding them enough fiber, they're going to die. And the ones that we are feeding with you know, meat and sugar are going to win. And that will lead to mucosal degradation. So there's there's lots of factors. Unfortunately, again, our Western society is kind of sets us up to naturally have this. And we have to get educated and make sure that we are doing good things for our gut to kind of prevent it or correct it from happening once it happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's, I hate to say that we're like fighting this battle against just the world in general, but it kind of is that way, at least for Americans, where you can't just live like the way a normal American lives and expect to have good health. It's sad that that's the case, but it is something where you do have to make some changes. You do have to 
take different steps. And it doesn't have to necessarily be something super extreme, like what we were saying before about, you know, pulling out all these foods and everything. But unfortunately, they're, like you said, the lifestyle that has been created for Western society, for lack of better term, is one that actively harms gut health in general, which is a huge bummer, but it's something that, again, you know, just getting educated and understanding what those issues are and doing your best to avoid them or change them is really important. So with gut health issues, I know that your perspective is that the gut is really one of, if not the core root cause of these different dermatological condition. So how does improving gut health end up playing a role in healing these for people? It really does stem back to that leaky gut and then this chronic leaking into the bloodstream causing inflammation. The body has to create chemicals in the body, which we call cytokines. And cytokines are inflammatory chemicals that again, so when we when we talk about inflammation, I feel like inflammation gets a bad rap now, right? We're like, oh, we have to, you know, get, we want anti-inflammatories and we need to suppress inflammation. There's two sides to inflammation. Inflammation is good in what we say in acute sense. If you cut your finger, even a paper cut, you need inflammation to heal it. You get coronavirus, you need inflammation to fight that virus and get over it. So inflammation in and of itself is not bad. It is good when it's acute. We want the body to get in there, create this inflammation, manufacture more of these inflammatory cytokines, ramp up our immune cells, go on the attack, fix the wound, kill that you know invader that's threatening the system. But then we need resolution, right? We don't want a chronic war like where it just never, never ends. We want to go in, fight the war, win the battle, and then we want to send everybody home and send the peacekeepers in and be like, okay, it's over. Everybody calm down and we go back to not being in a war situation. The problem with this chronic leaky gut is that the war never stops. We're just in this chronic fight and chronic inflammation. And the body is just constantly trying to fight all this stuff in the bloodstream and it never ends. And those inflammatory cytokines and activated increased immune cells they're in the blood. So they're going everywhere. And it's not just even the skin. Like in psoriasis, there are what we call comorbidities, which are other conditions that go along with it. So if you have psoriasis, you are more likely to have heart disease, diabetes, depression, fatty liver. Honestly, if you name a system in the body and you have psoriasis, you're more likely to have a problem with it because It's all in your body going in your bloodstream is all this inflammation. Now, part of what would make somebody get psoriasis versus vitiligo, you know, versus eczema is genetics. So we say genetics load the gun, environment pulls the trigger. So you are going to be predisposed to getting one thing more than the other. Like no matter how much inflammation there is in your system, you may never get psoriasis, but you may get eczema or you may get alopecia areata and lose your hair. But it really goes back to about 80% of our immune system is manufactured from what's going on in the gut. And so we got to we got to calm that down and heal up that leaky gut and stop that chronic influx into the bloodstream to stop that chronic basically war that's going on in our body, fighting it. You know, the skin is our largest organ. You know, if you cut yourself anywhere, you're going to bleed immediately. So we have a huge blood flow to the skin. And if you have systemic inflammation, all of your skin are getting those chemicals and immune cells. And it just takes a little bit of genetic predisposition for you to then develop, you know, a chronic dermatological disease. Mm -hmm. And is this the same for if somebody has like a random type of flare, like an eczema thing that happens like once a year or something like that? Because I know I've seen clients before that they they don't have eczema as a chronic symptom, but they'll be like, oh, I just randomly got this eczema patch for like a week or something. Is that the same, the same issue as the gut causing that? Yeah, I'm sure that if if we went in and gut tested them and I do a stool test and a urine test, we would see that there are many issues. But I talk to patients and I say, look, the body is actually pretty resilient. We can deal with a lot of stuff. And there's something called the body burden. So I liken it to a bucket and we're filling up the bucket. So I live in Los Angeles and when it's not COVID, 
there's a lot of traffic. And so we're sitting in the cars and we're sucking up exhaust from the cars in front of us. And the body's like, okay, I'm going to detoxify that and deal with that. And then maybe we get in touch with somebody who's got the flu. And so we got the flu. So the body has this bucket and it's constantly filling up with things that it needs to deal with. And it's dealing and it's dealing and it's dealing. And you're not going to see anything going on while the bucket is below the rim. But at a certain point, we get filled up to the top and then it spills over. Once it spills over, we are going to start to see problems and symptoms. You're going to start to see an eczema rash. You're going to start to see alopecia areata or other things like hypertension or bloating and gas. So it depends where that bucket is. Those people who tend to flare maybe once a year, they're probably right kind of riding towards the top of the bucket and then something happens. So a lot of my, all basically all of my patients who have had COVID, their skin issues have flared because the immune system is getting totally activated and fired up to fight it. And so there, it is reflected in the skin. Maybe those people who get eczema once a year, it has to do with allergies. And so it's in the spring when there's pollen and their immune system is activated, trying to fight this pollen invader, which is not an invader, but their body thinks it is. And so that's when they're going to flare for their eczema. But it still behooves them to go in and do this gut testing and lower the body burden, lower that bucket so that they're not on the threshold because it's not normal to have eczema. The skin is meant to function properly on its own. It's meant to provide a healthy barrier to keep certain things out, but let certain things in. And you know, it's not supposed to do that. And so if it is, you still got a problem inside. It's just not as big a problem as somebody who's got it chronically year round. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's a really important point to tell people that, first of all, the overall bucket's probably a little high, <laughs> you know, like just in general, which again, we were saying it is a little difficult sometimes with our the world we live in to totally avoid everything that's going to fill that bucket. But even just being able to notice, you know, what might have happened that led up to that flare that could have been the thing that spilled the bucket and maybe trying to focus on eliminating that out of their life as much as possible. Because we can't do everything, right? Like you're, if you're in LA, you're not going to totally avoid air pollution, right? I live in North Carolina. We have a couple of months out of the year where it's like that much pine dust on everything. And it's like, you're tasting it as you're walking outside. It's like, you're not really going to be able to avoid that. But if there are things that can be avoided or can be minimized, it's important to kind of know what your triggers are and know, you know, what can you do to help mitigate that without being neurotic about having to be like, in pristine circumstances for your body to function. Now, I know you had mentioned in the notes preparing for our conversation today that there are some specific foods that can cause flares in different skin conditions. So I'd love to hear about that because we were talking about food sensitivities not being necessarily the most important thing or something that people should be really getting overly excited about. But is it so? Are you saying that there are specific foods that can trigger specific skin conditions? And if so, what are those? Yeah, there's kind of two buckets when it comes to foods and skin disease. One is the foods in general that tend to affect all derm diseases because it's affecting the gut and the system. So, those two that are kind of my main, you know, culprits that if I can, I like to take out are dairy and wheat. So, let's talk about dairy first. And I go through this with my patients. I'm like, what is dairy? Why does dairy exist on the, on the earth? What is the function of it? And usually they get to, well, okay, it's, it's food for babies. And that's correct. It's food for babies, mammals. And inherently milk contains a lot of hormones because the whole point of a baby drinking milk is they need to get a lot of calories and they need to grow like crazy. Baby mammals are often pretty underdeveloped and pick any mammal from human to elephant to gazelle, if that little baby does not grow really, really fast, it's not going to survive. And so every time we drink milk, we're giving the body the signal, hey, life or death situation, like grow like crazy, which is why it contains a lot of growth hormones. That's great if you're a baby mammal of that species. But as humans, we drink milk throughout our lives. We are the only species on the planet who drinks milk into adulthood and who drinks the milk of another species. We know like a mama wolf at some point, she's just cutting off those wolf pups. It's not happening, right? That she's like, I'm over this. And now you need to go hunt a caribou and get some meat because that milk supply is cut off. And if another adult from the wolf pack tried to go suckle from that mama wolf, 
she would go to town on him. She'd be like, what are you doing? You're crazy. But we do this every day. You know, people eat milk in their cereal and we eat dairy all day long. Unfortunately, it's not a natural food substance. And so I like, I like to separate it. It's delicious, right? Cheese and milk and cream. We're not debating the deliciousness of dairy, but when we look at it as an appropriate food source, it's not actually something we're meant to be eating as adult humans. You know, it would actually make more sense if we made human breast milk ice cream, but nobody wants to eat that. <laughs> that people are like, oh, that's disgusting, but we'll eat, you know, a cow's milk because we're used to it. So dairy really is inflammatory. It causes a lot of problems in general for people. I like to cut it out if possible. Wheat is the other one. Wheat is one of those things, again, it's ubiquitous in our food supply. We eat it three times a day, every day. But when we look at wheat as a food source, it is, you know, if you can think about what wheat looks like growing in a field, it's very different form. You can't just pick wheat and start to eat it like you would a cucumber, right? That's cucumbers in the form. Vegetables are kind of in the form. Wheat needs a lot of processing. And wheat does not need humans to help it. Actually, it hurts it. Wheat wants the wind to disperse its seeds and its babies, and that's how it's going to proliferate and grow. When a mammal like a human or deer comes and starts eating grains, that actually kills the plant and kills its babies. So it doesn't like that. And there are things like lectins and gluten in wheat that don't play well with our system. We can handle sometimes certain amount, of course, unless you have celiac disease, and then you cannot have any gluten whatsoever. It's pretty toxic. But there's also gluten sensitivities and there's gliadin and gluten, which are wheat proteins that go in and can contribute to leaky gut because there's a protein called zonulin that actually tells our cells in our intestinal tract to open up a little bit. And it kind of causes a temporary leaky gut every time we eat wheat. Well, if you're already suffering from a leaky gut, you really don't need something that's going to make it even worse every time you eat it. And with specific diseases... It's interesting when we poll like patients with psoriasis and patients with eczema, it's about 50-50 when they cut out wheat. It can make a dramatic difference or no difference at all. And it can come down to whether or not people are producing antibodies and have a food sensitivity to it. But again, if people are willing to cut it out, at least for a trial, I like to do that. Sometimes it helps, sometimes it won't, but it's still one of those bigger ticket items that I like to try to get out. Some people really have a tough time with it. And if that's the case, and we do a trial for two weeks and they don't see a difference, I don't want to make their life a misery. So we'll put it back in. When it comes to specific foods, that can depend on the specific disease. So for rosacea, for example, rosacea is that skin disease where people get redness on their face. It can look a little like acne, but it's not acne. It's a very different thing that's going on. And what we say that they're having is something called vasodilation. That means that their blood vessels are expanding on their face. There's more blood, and that is causing part of the redness that you see in rosacea. And a lot of triggers for rosacea patients are things like spicy food, hot beverages. So it's not caffeine. People with rosacea are always like, oh, are you going to take away my coffee? I'm not. I just don't want you to drink your coffee when it's like super piping hot because drinking those hot things or spicy food enhances the vasodilation or the expansion of the blood vessels and will cause more blood to rush to the face. And that makes the rosacea even worse. So there's a lot of those types of trigger foods. So spicy foods, like I said, things with capsaicin and capsaicin is in like peppers and things like that. With psoriasis in particular, alcohol is a big one. Gluten, alcohol, and nightshades are the top three. And again, alcohol, we talked about, it's gonna degrade that mucosal lining. It is inflammatory in and of itself, right? Alcohol is a toxin. We like it because it gives, makes us feel a little bit buzzed and relaxed, but it's, it's kind of a toxin. So half the people will find that it absolutely makes them flare gluten, and nightshades. Nightshades is a class of vegetables that contains things like tomatoes, peppers, like bell peppers, eggplant, even goji berries. And they can cause flares in 50% of the people with psoriasis and 50% of the people with eczema. So it kind of varies. With most of my patients, we'll talk about their specific case. And aside from the dairy and gluten, what other specific foods it would be good to do tests with cutting it out. But as we've talked about, I don't want to create orthorexia and just start like taking out massive parts of their diet. 
So we'll, we'll play around with it, but taking out, you know, sugar, dairy, wheat, and alcohol is probably a good idea. Again, if, if people can do it without it being too triggering for them. Mm -hmm. I mean, I feel like those four food things, I wouldn't, you know, whether we call them food, if it's like sugar and alcohol, but, you know, I think our American diet is generally made up of that in most situations, like you were saying, like cereal and milk for breakfast and probably like a sandwich with some cheese on it at lunch and, you know, pizza or whatever for dinner. And then you have beer with your pizza and it's just like this, you know, kind of bad combination of all of those things. But then there's also, like you said, some of those vegetables and stuff that you wouldn't necessarily think are bad for you. And they're not technically bad for you. It's just certain people react to those. And I've seen for sure some pretty astounding transformations with people doing like an autoimmune protocol where they do the AIP diet. They're, they're on it for 30 days. They do the reintroductions and maybe they find that like, like you said, the nightshades are the thing that was really, you know, the big trigger for them. And so the goal isn't to just be off those foods forever. But I think sometimes a little trial like that can be really helpful because sometimes you don't know that something's triggering you until you take it out for a bit. I can tell you have a ton of knowledge about skin conditions and there's just so many things I'm sure we could talk about. Um, We'll have to have you on the show again in the future. But if people wanted to learn more about the way that you work with clients and how you can help them with these specific skin conditions, where can they get in touch with you or learn more about what you do with the integrative dermatology? Yes. So my website is integrativedermatologycenter.com. I will say as a doctor, I'm only licensed to see patients in states in which I'm licensed. So that's California, Oregon, and Washington. I can only see patients who are located in one of those three states. Um, I don't have clients as a doctor. It's a a patient-doctor relationship. So if you're in one of those three states, California, Oregon, and Washington, you can contact me and I might be able to take you on as a patient. But my website, integrativedermatologycenter.com, has information about different skin diseases. There's lots of podcasts uh, where I talk about specific diseases if people are looking for information. And there's a site, learnskin.com, where it's really more for licensed professionals. Um, I have a 20-course series called the Naturopathic and Integrative Dermatology Series, and it's 20 courses really doing a deep dive into the scientific research on a lot of the stuff that I've talked about. So if you have some more scientifically minded listeners, you can head on over to Learn Skin and do a search for my name and that series will come up. Awesome. And is that series for any particular type of practitioner? Like I know we have a lot of dietitians that listen to this podcast. Is it just for doctors or is it for any healthcare provider that wants to learn more about skin issues? It's for any healthcare provider and there are continuing educational credits. So there's AMA, PRA, category one. So if nutritionists can use those, there's naturopathic credit and there's nursing credit. Um, So I think it depends, but uh, like one of the courses, Gut Dysbiosis and Skin Health was, I edited all of them, but it was actually authored by uh, two nutritionists, Jennifer Fugo, who I know has been a guest on your show and Jennifer Brand. So they co-authored that one. So yes, it's definitely for nutritionists as well. A lot of this information is going to be pertinent for you guys. And I find that usually my approach and my protocols as a naturopathic doctor treating skin are much more in line with nutritionists than certainly than dermatologists because steroids is not the way I go. So I think a lot of the information will be useful and a lot of that scientific background on what's happening in the person And so the 20 courses cover a lot of different things. So there's like naturopathic approach to acne, to eczema, to psoriasis, where you can look at specific diseases and then more general courses. Like I had a nutritionist do one on uh, like vitamins A, D, and E on skin disease. So you can look through the titles and take what you think would be most interesting for you. And they're all free. And if you're eligible for any of those CE credits, you can take the quiz at the end and get um, continuing educational credit. Wow. That sounds like a really amazing resource. I was not expecting you to say that they were free, but that's really great. Cause I have a lot of, um, I work with as a business coach for a lot of nutritionists and I think a lot of them want to learn more about these issues, want to learn more about how to effectively work with clients with skin conditions. And like you said, nutrition is a huge part of it. So I know it takes a multi pronged approach and the more people that can be educated about how to do it, the better. So that's a really awesome resource. We'll make sure to link to that in the notes for the episode. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Greenberg, for coming on and chatting with us about skin today. It was really great to have you. And like I said, just the level of knowledge you have is really awesome. And 
the resources that you're providing, especially for providers, I think is going to be really valuable for changing the conversation around skin and making sure that people are really getting the help that they need and not just slapping a, a steroid on and hoping for the best. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. It was really fun to talk with you about all these issues. Awesome. And thanks to everybody for listening. We will see you here next week on the Fed and Fearless podcast. Take care, everybody. Hey there, Laura here again. Thank you so much for listening to the Fed and Fearless podcast. Your time is your most precious resource, and I'm so grateful that you choose to spend some of it with me. Now, if you're enjoying the podcast and want to continue supporting my work on this show, I would very much appreciate it if you would leave a review on iTunes. By leaving a five-star review, you'll help others find the show and help me spread my message to a larger audience. You can go to fedandfearless.com forward slash review to find a button that'll take you right to iTunes to leave your review. And I have a special gift for you as a thank you for helping me share the podcast. Once you leave your review, send a screenshot of the review to hello at lauraschoenfeldrd.com or you can DM it to me on Instagram at lauraschoenfeldrd. Once you do, I'll share a free copy of my Overcoming Under Eating ebook. Then share a favorite podcast episode in your Instagram stories and tag me at lauraschoenfeldrd. And I'll also give you a free copy of my 14-day calorie challenge recipe guide. Together, these bonuses are worth $44 and will help you become fed and fearless. And you'll get them absolutely free for just helping me grow the podcast. Again, thank you so much for your support. And I'll see you here next week for the latest episode. 